I would just go in on my lunch break and just casually, boom, spend $500 at Nordstrom's. And, you know, I'm in $10,000 worth of credit card debt because of shopping. The rise of social media and the pandemic. Yes. Those were two things that just poured gasoline on what was kind of already a problem. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Happy and Healthy. Happy Tuesday. If you guys are listening on a Tuesday, we drop these every single Tuesday, and I am so excited to be back on the podcast. So we are now in the month of August. What the heck? I'm like not even prepared. I'm like, how is the how is the year at this point? I, I don't even understand. Wait, are we in the month of August when I'm dropping this? Yes, we are. It'll be August 2nd, I believe, when we are posting this. Um, oh, the first. Okay. So happy August, everybody. Uh, what are your goals this month? What are some things that you guys are wanting to go through this month and maybe journal through or pray through? Um, I actually don't know mine, but that's something I definitely want to process through. And that's something I encourage you guys to do is every month kind of set many micro goals for that month. And so what are your goals this month? What are some things that you're praying through? What are some things that you would like to see change? What are some things you'd like to see go or be improved? And so I think just take some time today to process through that on this lovely August 1st. And it's so crazy because that basically means that fall is like a month and a half away, which I'm like, what? How? Oh my gosh. Time is flying. I just, I just don't, I don't like it. So anyway, (laughs) last month in July, we did solo episodes and I did one with Caleb, which you guys really seem to enjoy. So I'm really, really glad. Um, I still feel like when I talk about like solo episodes, it means I'm not necessarily having like a guest, but Caleb is my forever guest, which is so fun. Oh my gosh. Um, but we are back to kind of doing some guest episodes as well as solo episodes. So For today's episode, I'm actually bringing on a guest today, and I told you guys that I wanted to talk about money. Now, we are talking about finances in today's episode with Paige Pritchard, and it's a great episode. We talk about overspending. She gives investing tips. She talks about um, pay yourself first. She gives a lot of just tips overall within finances. She's really great, and she talks about how she had a really really big overspending problem. So we touch upon that at the end of the episode, and I really learned a lot from this episode episode. So hopefully you guys will as well. But what I'd love to do is still do another episode about money, biblically money about like tithing and giving and how does God see money and what are the dangers of money? And I just want to do another personalized episode about money because there's a lot to money. Now, the reason why I haven't talked so much about money is like, I'm not a money savvy girl. Like I have a financial advisor and accountant for that because I don't, typically know, like, obviously I know don't overspend, don't spend more than you make. Like I know the the general basics, but when it comes to, you know, investing or overall super budgeting tips, I'm not totally your girl. Now I never spend more than I make. I always try to make sure I save and I try to use as many points and credit card hacks and all the things like that. However, that's why I've been a little bit iffy talking about money because I'm not a professional and I never want to give advice that's wrong. So that's why I wanted to bring on someone like Paige and I'd like to do that. And down the road, maybe I do bring on a financial advisor, but I do think I have some tips and some thoughts on biblical viewpoints of money. And I'd love to do another episode on that at some point. So I think today's episode is going to be convicting. It was convicting for me. These are definitely not things I have fully fleshed out, but even talking to her, I was like, okay, yeah, these are some things that I need to work on. And so I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. I will still be doing solo episodes throughout the month of August. I have another one coming that I'm really excited to talk about. So stay tuned for that. And before we get into today's episode, I actually wanted to just shout out to one of our new monthly donators. Let me find it, but her name is Mercedes and she She is donating monthly to the podcast. She's decided to donate $10 a month, which is so, so sweet. You guys running a podcast is actually very, very expensive. I don't know if everybody, everybody knows that, um, to pay a team and to have all the software to upload and download and do all the things it's expensive. So Thank you. Thank you to our monthly donator, Mercedes, for pitching in every single month and sowing a seed into this podcast. That means the absolute world to me. So if you guys ever want to do that, the link is always down below, but it is never expected. It is never something that I would ever force upon anybody, but I just want to make sure that you guys know how I am so forever grateful if you do. So 
thank you guys. I love that. I love that you guys are just so, you know, in belief of me and in this podcast. So let's just get right into today's episode. And I pray it's a blessing. If you enjoyed this episode, share it on IG. We will repost it and let's just get right into it. Paige, welcome to Happy and Healthy. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so of excited course. to be here. Yes, thank you for coming. I uh, We were just talking a second ago that you live in Coppell, which is about 40 minutes away from Dallas. Yeah, like 30, 40, right by the airport. And your neighborhood okay. ran out of water. It did. I was telling Janine, I was like, I'm happy to come here today because I woke up with <laughs> no water. My entire city had no water. That's insane. So it was like cool just to like get out. My husband's like, get water while you're out. Yeah, I was he's like, like, bring okay. his chugs back. <laughs> Plus it is so hot in Texas oh right now. God. It's like 108 today. Can I just say my parents have been staying with us for the past five days because their air conditioning went out like oh, a couple no. days ago. The air conditioning company was like, you need a part. It's not going to be in for five days. And I'm like telling my mom, "Lovely, you realize <laughs> it's going to be 110 degrees outside. Yeah. I actually have so. AC people coming today to double check because I'm so scared it's going to give out. Yeah. And I feel like it's going to because everybody's does. So I was like, can you please just like double check this? to be preventative. <laughs> yeah. I feel Anyways. Good. So, uh, welcome to happy and healthy. I'm Thank so you. excited. I think your team reached out. And, um, when I saw that I was immediately like, yes, we need to have her come on because you are going to be talking about money today, mm -hmm. which is a very daunting topic for sometimes people. Like yeah. I know for me, it's a little, it's a little scary to talk about money. I you get know? it. I get it. It can be very overwhelming and you just don't even know where to start. And yeah. I mean, you know, I, I really kind of talk about all things money, but where I really kind of specialize and work with people on is I say once you get the money, mm. because even even money as a general topic is so broad. Yeah, there's so many things. And I feel like a lot of things with money, it's making money. You hear yeah. a lot about like how to negotiate a raise and how to get paid your worth. Mm. And I think all of that is really important. But I come in when it's like, once you get the money okay, and then I help you manage it. And I also do most of my work around spending and shopping. Oh, dun, and, dun, dun. I know. Impulse <laughs> shopping. Oh my gosh. Okay. So before we get into that, um, I'd love for you just to introduce your story, your background. Um, why are you so passionate about this and what made you kind of want to like get into this? Yeah. So I always say that I got into this work. It's very autobiographical with my own personal struggles with impulse shopping. So I actually, when I was 22, I impulse shopped my entire way through my annual salary. And a lot of people hear that and are very shocked by that. But it really is, I say there's like, you know, a, a purpose to my story and a purpose in my message because it's why I do what I do today. So I went to A&M, not too far from here. I'm um, hook, I'm sorry. I, oh, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. No, I'm just kidding, we're not rivals really. <laughs> I know. So um, went to A&M and graduated. My very first job out of college was selling cars. Nice. And I moved back home with my parents because I had $40,000 of student loan debt. And I was like, listen, I'm gonna live at home. I'm gonna pay down this debt. I'm gonna save up some money. And essentially the opposite of that ended up happening that year. I found out very quickly that I hated my job. Oh, <laughs> I did not yeah. like selling cars very much. And I really just, I was going through a hard time. Like I just, I really didn't handle like the transition from college to real world very well. I missed my friends. I ended the relationship with my college boyfriend. And like, I thought we were going to get Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it was just a time where I was kind of going through it and shopping was my coping mechanism. Like shopping was my escape. And so I would leave the dealership and I would go up to North Park. Mm, this we was, love North Park. I know. <laughs> but it's trouble. So I would go up to North Park Mall, which if you're not in Dallas, it's this, it's, it's a nice mall. Yeah. There's some, there's some nice stores. Like you can do some damage at North Park. And I would just go in on my lunch break and just casually just boom spend $500 at Nordstrom's wow. and that was happening like multiple times a week and the end of that year came and I had basically shopped it all away like it was time to move out my parents were like hey it's been a year like time for you to go wow and I remember I couldn't even afford a security deposit to pay for an apartment because wow. all of my money was in my closet right <laughs> like I had a killer wardrobe but I didn't make any progress towards my student loans. I had no savings. I couldn't even afford really to move out. And wow. that was the moment where I really kind of had to be like, what have I done, honestly? So wow. it kind of just like started from there. But I will say that a lot of the advice that I started searching for to solve this problem, it wasn't really relatable advice and it mm. didn't really like fix the inner problem of why I was shopping so much, right? Like 
you know, I would go on Google and it would be like unsubscribe from emails and, <laughs> you know, like unfollow people on social media uh -huh. and delete your credit card autofill. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. I don't need the email. I'm just going to go to the store or you don't understand. Like I have my credit card number memorized. Right. Like, these tips aren't helping. Me, yeah. Right? That's funny. So I had to, I had to find something deeper and do the inner work. And that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. But I will say like, I help people with money, but this is the one area that mm. Mostly women kept coming to me like in the cracks, like the cracks of my DMs, kind of like yeah. in secret being like, hey, listen, you know, I'm in $10,000 worth of credit card debt because of shopping. And I think within the last, I would say three to four years with, I'll say a couple things, really the rise of social media mm -hmm. and the pandemic. Yes. Those were two things that just poured gasoline on what was kind of already a problem. Yeah. And so- this is what I do now. Like it's wow. the one problem I can help you fix, which is impulse shopping and overspending. So. Man, I just already know that this is going to bless so many people because you're absolutely right, especially with TikTok. I mean, that was what boomed off in um, the pandemic and all the shopping. I mean, same thing for me. We were all bored. We're all clicking. Yeah. We're all wasting money for what? And we all order the most random things that we never used again. And I know that that's still a problem and it's gotten worse, you know, with Amazon and all the things it gets there in two seconds and you, it's like almost like invisible money in your mind. You're like, Oh, like it's fine. I'll make it back. But next thing you know, you're in 5,000, $40,000 in debt. And so, um, yeah, I definitely want to get more into that, but I'd love for you to share a little bit more of just like your background within like finance and where you went to school and all that, because you're not just obviously like someone that's passionate about this. Like you've studied this. Yeah. Yeah. So I studied marketing in my undergrad. I have an MBA in finance, so that definitely kind of sparked my interest in it. And then really, you know, most of what I've learned from money is self-taught. Like I've learned in books and from other podcasts and things like that. I have a life coaching certification and that really helps me blend like the how to with money yeah. with the behavioral aspect of money. Right. Mm. And I think that's really big because I think with money, we, we so often think of money as this very masculine, black and white, very like finite, logical thing. But when it really comes down to it, that's only 10% of it. Yeah. The other 90% of it, it's the mindset, the mentality and all the emotions behind it. And so that's where I kind of, my, my approach is different, so to speak. So if you're mm. someone you're like, I've tried budgeting. I've been given the steps. I've been given the how to, but yet I go out and do it and things keep falling short. Why is that? It's kind of like, well, there's a lot mm. happening underneath the surface. So that's where a lot of like my life coaching certification, the psychology mindset, emotional work comes in. That's such a good point because money is so emotional. It's just like food. It's just yes. like anything, like you don't think about it but there's always a why behind what you do. But a lot of that is also the way you were raised, the way you mm -hmm. saw money growing up, the way you saw your parents wipe the cards. Yeah. If you had money growing up, if you didn't have money growing up, there's so much to it that I don't think a lot of people address. No, it's, there's some fascinating stat that says that most of your money beliefs and the way that you view money in the world and see money in the world is formed by age seven. It's happening very, very young. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that shocking? That's like sad. <laughs> it, it kind of is. You don't have a and, choice. <laughs> well, and because we view it as this very like logical thing, we think that there's all these rules. Mm. So when you're little, like let's just say when you're five or six, you're learning so much about the world and you're learning so many facts about the world. Like you're learning that like the sky is blue and you're, you're learning all these things. But then also at the same time, you're learning all of these things about money but a lot of the things that you're learning about money when when you're that age, typically you're you're learning from like your caregivers, you know, just like the people that you're spending time around. When you're that little, you don't know how to decipher between what's an actual fact of the world and what's just someone's belief. Mm, yeah. So like when you grow up in a household where people are like, money doesn't grow on trees, money is the root of all evil. Like you're hearing all of these like bad things about money. Yeah. You just kind of think like, okay, like that's just what money is. So then you carry that into adulthood. And so much of how we manage our money as adults are coming from that place that we haven't even actually slowed down to say, is this what I believe? Like, yeah. is, is this my actual experience with money? Or is this just something that I absorbed mm. when I was really little and I've carried it with me and I'm still using that today as an adult? 
Right. That's so. such a good point. Yeah. I feel like at some point with anything in life, you have to make the decision for yourself. And that's mm-hmm. what's kind of stinks about adulting is you have to do that. You have to yeah. at some point be like, I'm no longer on my parents' money on their insurance, you know, whatever at 26, I think you get cut off. So there comes a point where it's like, okay, I've got to figure out what I believe. And it's just like with anything else within your faith, within anything that you learned as you were younger. But what's hard though, is that we don't have the tools all the time. Like, I mean, I know you read the books. I'd love to hear some of those books for people because a lot of people come to me and they're like, can you talk about finances? And I'm like, I don't even like, it is such a daunting topic to me because I I have a financial planner to help me. I have an accountant because I don't know, like no one taught me this, but that's majority of young adults. They graduate college just like you did. They spend their money. They don't know how to save, how to invest, what to do. It is a very overwhelming thing. And I wish college taught that better. Oh, I I mean, I think personal finance should be taught in high schools. Like I mean, personal finance taxes. I like, I just think that this is stuff that we should learn in high school. But to your point, like, unfortunately we just don't. Right. But here is my biggest thing is that I say, when you're starting out and wanting to learn a lot about money, my biggest piece of advice is in the beginning, go out and learn from a lot of people and see what resonates with you. Mm. I feel like the trap that a lot of us get into is when we get into this financial space, there tends to be like a couple of like big names, heavy hitters that people go to just because they're big and they've been, right. they've been around for forever and they're very far reaching. And so like when you just go to Google and Google, you know, stuff about money, they're the first people yeah, to pop Dave up. Dave Ramsey pops up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't going to say Dave Ramsey, but yeah, like he's, <laughs> you and, can say and it. Listen, so, so for me, like when, when I was going and learning about money, Dave Ramsey was the first person that I came across mm. again. Cause like, he's just, I mean, he's one of the, he's biggest, the money guy. Yeah. He's the money guy. Like he's in the game. Right. But my biggest piece of advice is go out and learn from a lot of different people and see what resonates with you. Like I say, treat it like a buffet. So go and take the things that you like and take the things that resonate with you and leave the things that don't. Don't feel like you have to follow every single thing that this one person is telling you Mm. because you have to understand at the end of the day that those people are talking to millions upon millions of people. They don't know you. They don't know your life. They don't know your personal situation. And I'll say this, like with women, especially, I feel like with money, we're constantly given this narrative. Again, this is like the messaging when we're little growing up of we're just not as good with money compared to our male counterpoints. Mm -hmm. And so we already have this idea in our head that we're not good with money and that we need to find the answers outside of us. And so my biggest thing is don't feel like you need to follow this one person system step by step. Like, right. Like, like, let's just use the baby steps. Mm -hmm. You don't have to follow the seven baby steps. If, if you evaluate it, and you look at your life and you say like, I like this one part of it. I don't think I necessarily like this other part of it. Like this resonates with me, but this doesn't resonate with me. Give yourself the per- permission to kind of make your own system that works for you. And mm-hmm. there doesn't need to be any guilt or any shame with doing that. Yeah, I think that's wise advice because it. Do- it I feel like just with anything else, it takes time to learn yeah. who you are, what you like, what works for you. Because my finances are different than your finances, you know? Yeah. But I think what is hard is there's so much information out there that you're like, what, is this right? Is that wrong? Do I, how do I do this? So what would be your piece of advice to, you know, the girl that's in her young adult years, she's got her first job and um, she's like, look, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I want to grow. I want to be more stable and um, they want to invest, you mm-hmm. know, they, but they don't know how to grow their income. A lot of girls are living paycheck to paycheck or people yeah. paycheck to paycheck, yeah. which that is most of America. But what would be your advice to them to provide some security and to have some longevity financial wise? Yeah. Well, here's like the one big principle. Like if you're just going to take one principle away, it's if you can nail the principle of paying yourself first, which is a very popular principle in the personal finance world, that's going to put you ahead of 90% of people. What pay yourself first means is it means that you are taking care of future you, future Paige, future Janine, mm-hmm. and then and then you take care of present you. So it's almost like I'm going to take care of the future version of me first, and then I'm going to fit what I need in the present moment and what's left. So it's essentially save first, spend later, which 
Most people do it the other way around. So what yeah, most like, people do, yeah, and it and, and it's definitely it's easier said than done. I totally get that. What most people do though is they will spend first and then save second. So they're like, I'm going to spend on the things that I want in this present moment, and then I'll save whatever's left over. But the reality of it is, is that with that, most people, at least from what I've seen, like in the women in my community and my clients, when you're doing that, you're going to pretty much spend everything that you have. So I always say like, make saving for future you a priority. I'm also really big on automation. I don't think that money has to be hard or it has to be difficult. 90% of everything you do with your money can be automated. So it's just kind of like automating your bills, automating your debt payments if you have any, and then working towards one financial goal at a time. So what is the one financial goal you want to be working on right now? Is it getting out of credit card debt? Is it building up a down payment for a house? What is that? And then figure out how much do I need on either like a monthly basis or a paycheck basis to fund that goal and automate it. So that's good. Everything can be automated, but do all of that first, like take care of future you, like be thinking about yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, like 20 years from now and take care of all of that first and then figure out what's left. And then you're like, okay, how can I fit kind of like, I call them all the fun stuff, right? Like kind of like the nice to haves, but they're not the need to haves. How can I fit what I want into what's left after I've done all of that? Because if you can nail that, again, you're going to be ahead of 90% of people out there. I love that. And yeah, I think that's absolutely, I, I don't hear people say that very often. And it just makes sense. It's like, because I think that's the problem. A lot of people have anxiety and stress because they're like, I don't know if I can pay my rent. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. And um, yeah, they're they're spending money buying birthday gifts. They're spending money appeasing other people. They're spending money to impress people that don't even matter. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. And it's exhausting and you run out of money quicker. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with that because the reality is, is that so many of us are spending so much money for other people. Like mm. it's for us, but it's really for other people. Right. Yep. And that's like one of my big things. Like one of my favorite questions that I always have my clients ask themselves, like for those who are kind of struggling with over spending and impulse shopping is really kind of tapping into who is this really for? Like, is it really for me or is this really for other people? And I love thinking about, I, you know, I, I do this before I buy something. I always say, if no one was ever able to see this thing or this item, like if nobody knew I had this, if nobody knew I owned this, if I couldn't show it on social media, if I couldn't tell anybody about it, would I still want this thing? And would I still buy this thing? Because really that aligned your spending so that it's it's for you and it's, and it's aligned to you and it's not for other mm. people. Cause I think that's how, to your point, that's how like we get sucked into trends. It's like how much stuff that you like look in your closet and you're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> like I just got, I oh got sucked gosh. into that trend and that's how you get to a point where you look around your environment and you're like, nothing feels like me. Like yeah. my closet doesn't feel like me. My home doesn't feel like me. And it's because we're spending our money for other people, not really for us. That's a really good point. Yeah. I think that's a, just a good question you had to ask yourself. Like, yeah. pause. A lot, of, a lot of the times, the problem is, and I think even with food, you're distracted. You're distracted yeah. shopping, distracted eating. And so you're not really processing and you're just swiping the card, clicking add to cart, and you're not really slowing down to be like, do I actually need this? And it's a great, great question to ask yourself. Yeah. So um, you mentioned just like, you know, taking care of yourself first. If someone wants to start growing some passive income or investing, what would be your number one tip for that person? Yeah. So I would say just like making it a priority with your finances, right? So all of that really can be automated, right? And so I say like, it doesn't have to be hard or it doesn't have to be complicated, automate it, right? So there's going to be a little bit of work in the beginning to kind of like go and create the account and go and like set up the account. But then after that's done, you can essentially like, set up automations like from checking account into the investment account to to do that. With with investing, I say like index funds are great, right? Because I think with investing, we get really overwhelmed because we have questions like, 
what stock do I buy? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> like what stock, what stock do I buy? Oh my- How do I even buy a stock? You know what yep. I mean? But most of investing, you're not actually buying like individual stocks. You're kind of buying like a group of stocks, okay. like, like a family of stocks. Right. Yeah. So if you've ever heard of, um, like an, like an S&P 500. I knew you were going to say that. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, think about it this way. It's like you're essentially buying like a tiny little piece of the 500 biggest companies on the stock market. So you're Got buying it. a little bit of Apple, a little bit of Google, a little bit of Facebook, a little bit of GE, a little bit mm-hmm. of Coca-Cola. Like you're, so you don't actually have to do the work of picking and figuring out like what stock am I going to buy? So like index funds are just a really great place to start because they're low risk, they're low maintenance. They're going to follow the trends of the stock market, which a lot of investors who are actually picking individual stocks, like most of them even struggle to beat the stock market as a whole. Wow. So just start there. Like yeah. it can be really easy, really simple. Like it doesn't have to be hard or complicated. And do you have some apps that you recommend? Like I know there's like Robin Hood. I use Betterment actually. Is there oh, other yeah. places that you use? Or yeah, apps? Betterment's a good one. You know, I actually just use Fidelity. Okay. But I'll like Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, that sort of thing. I, I'm not like a super big fan of kind of like the Robin Hoods of the world because Yeah, I've heard some things about that. Yeah, because they're they're more so like picking individual stocks. Got right? it. So but again, like you could go to Fidelity right now, go to their homepage, you could open up an online account in five minutes, you could set up it's an automatic free. transfer. It's totally free. Okay, everyone yeah. you heard that. <laughs> yeah, totally free. It'll take you maybe like five or ten minutes to get it set up. You'll set up a transfer from your checking account. And my other big piece of advice is do it like set up that transfer on the days that you're paid. Okay. So if you're paid on you know, let's just say like the 15th of every month, set up that transfer on the 15th. Because what we want to do is we want to basically minimize the amount of time that you have Mm. to do something else with that money. That's so smart. So like if it's coming into your account on the 15th, just set that transfer up for the 15th. So like it's in and it's out and like you don't have the opportunity to spend that money elsewhere. Yeah. And isn't there like a saying that um, someone says, I can't remember, but it was like, uh, pretend like you never even had the money. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like you basically act like it's not there so that you don't even spend it. Is yeah. that kind of what you're saying? Like you're like, that never wasn't even deposited in my account because it's going straight to the savings or whatever. Yeah. And if and if you work like a corporate job where you have a 401k account that your company or that, that you're contributing into, it'll work the same way. Like that money okay. goes into the 401k account before it even hits your bank account. Like I know for us who own businesses and like, yeah. we don't have 401ks. Nope. <laughs> like we're not, we're not familiar with this concept, but for, I know a lot of you guys listening, like you work for an employer, they have a 401k, uh-huh. that money goes in there before it even, like it doesn't even come into your checking yeah. account. Right? Yeah. I had to make my own 401k because exactly. I was like, I don't have a company doing this for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't even know what I was doing. And then my financial investor, investor was like, you need some help, girl. I was like, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Yeah. That's so, so great. And I'll, I'll give one more, I guess, tool that I love. So if you're, if you're looking for a good kind of place to actually start tracking your money and like tracking your spending. So like the money that you actually are getting and that you're not investing and you're actually spending on bills and just other things. I'm a big fan of a budgeting software called YNAB. I'll send you the link for okay. it if you want to yeah. include it in the show notes. It stands for you need a budget like Y N A B. Yeah. I'm like, I do need a budget. <laughs> <I know>. um, <laughs> Don't tell me. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm, I'm a really big fan of YNAB. It, I use Mint. Have you heard of Mint? Yeah. Mint, I really like too. that one too. Mint's it's very too. clear, very easy to use. Yeah, so say, write like, that down Mint, people. Every dollar I use YNAB. I have for years. Okay. But just getting yourself like a good budgeting software. And again, like maybe you have to try a couple, mm-hmm. right? Like I've, I've heard some people they're like, I hated YNAB and I loved Mint Mm. or like Dave Ramsey's is every dollar. Some people really love every dollar, but just get yourself like a good kind of online software that you can use to track your spending and see where it's going um, so that you have some sort of sense of of where your money is actually going. Like I'm a really big fan of, especially for those of you who feel like you're struggling with overspending and impulse shopping like having that transparency into where your money is actually going Mm. is so huge. Yeah. That's what I was about to say is sometimes I feel like a lot of us just want to pretend out of sight, out of mind. And that is the biggest problem is that you're wasting your money away because you're not willing to address it. And I think, yeah, you've got to have a come to Jesus moment with yourself where you're like, okay, let me actually sit down and you look how much have I been spending on, you know, Starbucks every single day? How much have I been spending on eating out? And it is so much more than you realize. It's always so much more. Which is like, 
daunting, but you cut, you have to do that. You know, yeah, you I always know. say it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts mm. when you're doing it throughout the month. You're like, Oh, it's, it's $30. It's $15. Right. It's, it's, you know, whatever. It doesn't seem like a lot. And then when you total it up over the course of the month, you're like, Oh my God, I just spent $500 on yeah. whatever. And listen, I'm, I'm really big on just, just knowing that ev- like every single person's financial situation is different. That's why I say they're all like snowflakes. Like there's yeah. no one that's the same. And so also what you have to do is you have to get out of the mindset of like focusing on the numbers and thinking, oh my God, that's such a big number. Because I think that sometimes with our spending, we always want to compare it to other people. We always yeah. want to be like, well, what do you spend eating out? Well, what do you right. spend on this? What do you spend? Like, what do you spend on groceries? Like, that's a big one. But understanding that that's an apples to oranges comparison. So don't necessarily like kind of get yourself out of the mindset of comparing it to other people, but look at it from the lens of your own situation, yeah, your own income, your own expenses, your own lifestyle your own goals. Like, yeah. It's like, do you have three kids? Cause if you do, don't be comparing your grocery budget to somebody who's single exactly. and is only buying groceries for themselves. So kind of get yourself out of the mindset of like, well, what are you spending? What are you spending? And just look at what am I spending? Get some transparency around that. And then ask yourself, does that actually make sense Mm. for my situation? Like, do I feel good about that? Do I feel aligned with that? Does that, is it giving me what I need or, or do, do I look at this and I'm like, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's too much. I agree with that. That's great. And I, and I think also it matters about what you prioritize Totally. Because for some people, travel is important, but they don't really need to shop or they don't need to eat out or they'd rather cook at home. So I think it's also deciding what is a priority for me. Because for me, I would rather spend my money traveling than I would on a designer handbag. Like I couldn't care less about designer things. I'd rather buy a plane ticket, you know? So it's asking yourself, what is a priority to me and what am I willing to let go of? Because you can't really have it all, you know? Yeah. Unless maybe you are like a millionaire, but you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, so I teach this concept called your money loves, which is essentially the things that you love to spend money on. So for you, that's travel. And I find that most women, when I ask them that question, when I ask them like, what do you love to spend money on? They actually struggle to answer that question. I know the 22, 23 year old version of Paige would have told you clothes. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, oh, clothes, fashion, beauty, things like that. But honestly, that's just what I thought my answer should be. Like that's what I thought my answer should have been. Now, you know, I'm, I'm 34 now. So now I can tell you that like, I love spending money on convenience Anything that's yes. going to make my life easier, Uber that's going to like, <laughs> yeah, it's going to like save, save me time is really big for me. And personal development is another big area for me, but you have to, you have to know when you have to get clear on what is going to give me the biggest bang for my buck for me personally, mm. and know that for yourself. And that answer is going to be different for every single one of us. But to your point, is it travel and experiences? Is it convenience? Is it luxury like yeah. for like like some people's money loves are luxury like, for sure and that and I just want to say like if that's you that's okay like that's yeah. not something that needs to be a bad thing but it's just it's knowing that like for yourself so you can direct your money in that right, way right but I will say too like I'll make this point I'm just gonna say this like studies have shown that when we spend money on experiences we get a lot higher return just in terms of like happiness and fulfillment mm-hmm. than when you're spending it on like a physical product. Right. Right. Because products, like the second that we buy them, they start to depreciate, right? Oh, like, so sad. Like, like when you buy something and then you're like so excited about it. And then two weeks later, you're like, it's stored on the like, top of your closet yeah. and you never use it again. You've like move on to the next thing. Yeah. So products, like basically the second you buy them are going to depreciate mm-hmm. for most things. And then, but experiences, it's like even after they're over, they continue to appreciate. You have the memories. Yeah, the photos. The photos. The like conversations. The, yeah, yeah. Like the memories, like you often um, do those with other people, like the people that you love and trust and yeah. have close relationships with. So. Yeah. I feel like also with luxury items, I think- for me personally, I like to see it as more of a treat yourself thing. Yeah. Like, Hey, I really, I had a really big goal, so I'm going to you know, reward myself with that. But I don't even see that as a yearly thing. I don't see that as a quarterly thing. I don't see that. Like, I think if you really 
um, have been crushing it and you can, what's this say? If they say you can buy it three times, then you can buy it or then you should buy it. Is that what yeah, the saying I've, is? I've, saying is? I've heard the rule, like being able to pay for it with cash, like twice over. Or yeah. Something yeah. Yeah. Like something that. like yeah. that. Like, otherwise it's like probably not the smartest thing. So like maybe I think it's more rewarding when you've worked really, really hard and then you get it and then you're like, wow, like I work so hard versus just making it a continual habit in your life or a, you're now going in debt and B you're like, I'm bored of this. Yeah. Stick it up in the top of your closet. So yeah. I don't know. Well, and to add to that point, I, I'll say this because I think with like the rise of Amazon and just things becoming so incredibly convenient for us to get online, all of us, myself included, we've just become desensitized to having to like wait for things, to having yeah. to say like, I want this and I'm going to have to wait for it. And what I always tell my clients is, listen, the world that we live in is going to tell you not to wait. The world that we live in is going to tell you, like, get the pleasure now. Right. But when you are able to wait and when you're able to delay, you actually get, like, your brain, your brain mm. chemistry, you're actually going to get twice the amount of pleasure than if you buy it right away. Wow. So, like, with now, we have all these, like, buy now, pay later services, right? Like, after Which are pay. Dangerous. So dangerous. <laughs> I'm like, stay away. Yeah. Stay away. Um, the Klarna's and all that sort of stuff, which again, is just programming us to say like, oh, you want this $80 pair of shoes? You don't have to wait. Yeah. You like, just like give go, me, 20. go in debt for it. Yeah. Well, like, it's like, it's like, give me $20 today and you'll get the shoes, but then you're going to continue to pay for the shoes for the next three months. Whereas if you do it backwards, what I say is like, do it backwards, right? And give yourself the time to save because when you do that, you're getting twice the amount of pleasure. Because you're going to get pleasure just in the anticipation of it. And that's what our brains really like. Dopamine gets released in the anticipation of something. Mm, yeah. It, 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 gets, it gets released when we buy something, but it, it's mostly getting released when we anticipate something. That's why, like, the days leading up to a vacation feel so amazing yeah. and, like, almost feel better than the vacation itself <laughs> because it's the anticipation right. of what's to come. And so that's what I say, like, when you can practice that discipline. And when you can wait on buying something, it's twice as pleasurable. And to your wow. point that when you get it, you have it and you paid for it and you're not like continuing to pay for it. And so waiting actually has its benefits. Like I for know, sure. I know the world that we live in, it tells you like, don't wait, you don't have to wait. Like it's just a couple clicks away, but when you can wait, you're going to practice that discipline muscle and it's going to feel so much better. Amen. And delayed gratification is just something I think we should all strive for. Yeah. Is knowing like, okay, there is something produced in me in the waiting. And that's Absolutely. for any facet in your life, I feel like. Yeah. And it's it's a practice. And I, I want to say this because this is huge that I see with money. When it comes to money and being disciplined with money, a lot of the women that I talk to almost kind of hold this identity of themselves that they're not disciplined. Mm. Like they're like, my name's Paige. I have blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm five, five and I'm not disciplined. Right? Like, <laughs> it's like a part of their identity. Like, like, yeah. like, it's a, like it's a part of their DNA. And I'm like, you have to think of discipline and also spending like a skill. Mm. It's something that you build. It's a muscle that you, that you work and that you build over time and you have to practice it. Yeah. It can't be a part of your identity because when it's a part of your identity, that's just what you're going to live into. Yep. So start viewing discipline, not as something you either are or aren't permanently, but it's something that you can practice and work yourself towards. And that's exactly how you do it. You just practice it decision by decision, by decision, by decision. That's so good. Yeah. That's a good lesson for anything. Yeah. Daily, anything. daily habits. Anything. Yeah. That's yeah so good. Apply, apply that to anything really. Yeah. But Before we close out, the main thing I want to talk about, and I'm sorry, we waited till the end. No. <laughs> was the overspending and over shopping and all the things because yeah. we touched upon it. Social media has made it increasingly difficult. Like you said, everything's a click away. It's super easy. You get it tomorrow. And it's it's a real problem. I've had to untrain myself for that. In the whole month of May, I didn't let myself buy a single thing. And I realized when you fast from it, how hard it actually is. Yeah. And because I was going on, I went on two different trips that month and I was like, oh, I need to get new clothing. And I'm like, who told me that? Like who said I yeah. had to get new clothing? So I recommend anybody to take a break from that for even a month. But I'd love to hear your thoughts because you help women literally overcome this. Yeah. So with, with social media, here's like the thing that you have to remember, which I understand is really hard to do. Like when you get on social media and you just kind of start like mindlessly kind of scrolling, but 
you have to remember that everything you're seeing on social media, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And I think like at the end of the day, the only reason that we do what we do, whether it's shopping or something else, is because we want to feel a certain way. Whenever you want something, whenever you desire something, you only want it or desire it because of how you think you're going to feel once you get it, or once you have it. And so I always say, like, remember that because when you're on social media, what do we see? We see, you know, a, a three minute day in the life video yeah. where it's someone's 18 hour day boiled down to three minutes. And a lot of people are just going to show us the things that they want us to see. They're going to see us the most like beautiful, curated, best parts of their day. But something that our brain does, it's called projection. So our brain takes like a little snippet and it projects it. So it says, mm -hmm. okay, this person in this three minute video was happy and confident and, you know, all of these things that I want to feel. So they must feel like that all of the time. Mm -hmm. And our brains are so trained to connect and associate how we see someone feels to what they have in their external world. Wow. So yeah. we're going to see someone on social media and we're going to say, oh my gosh, they feel fill in the blank. It's going to be somehow that we want to feel. They feel happy. They feel confident. They feel successful, organized, productive, whatever. I want to feel like that. So what do I do? Well, if I want to feel like that, I just need to make my external world look like their external world because mm. that's why they yeah. feel that way. And so that's why we're so quick to just like jump to the Amazon storefront or jump to the like to know it page. But when you can make that realization of what I'm seeing isn't the full reality of someone's life and also understanding that all I'm really wanting in this moment is to feel better. And I'm really big. I actually think I've seen you talk about this too in a past video, but something I talk about a lot with social media is gaining inspiration from social media rather than being influenced. Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. I think I've seen you do a video. I on did this. one on envy versus inspiration. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're so quick to be influenced. So we're, we're so quick to be like, Oh, well, if I'm seeing somebody's morning routine, it's like, well, I need their coffee machine and I need their green drink and I need their journal. And I need, I need all the things that they have. That's influence. That's being influenced versus inspiration, which is, I like the way that she's taking care of herself or I like the way that she presents herself. I like the way that she's created success for herself and then dropping into, okay, well, how can I create that for me? Yeah. A, in your own world. In yeah. my own world with what I, with like things that I already have, right? Yeah. And just like, again, going back to that point, I know I keep saying it, but it's so key. It's like, all I want is to feel a certain way. So mm. how can I cultivate that feeling in my own life with what I already have? Because I guarantee you, you can do it. Yeah. I guarantee you. Yeah, that's such a great point because I do think you're absolutely right. A lot of people are like, if I'm going to be like her, I need to get exactly what she has, do exactly what she has. Yeah. And that's just not reality. Like you can't, you're not her. You're going to stay in your lane. God gave you your lane for a reason. So embrace that. And sure, there's nothing wrong if you do want to get her coffee machine. But I think, you know, some of them don't maybe have the finances to get that expensive Nespresso machine. So it's like, what do you have and what can you do with what you have already? Yeah. And I think to that point, it's like, if you want to get the coffee machine or something somebody else has, like do it, like there's nothing wrong with that. But I will say, don't do it under the guise of once I get it, it's going to deliver something to me. It cannot deliver to me. That's yeah. the trip up right there. That's so good. Because we'll buy things... We, we spend a lot of money trying to buy things that ultimately can't be bought. We spend a lot of money trying to buy self-worth, confidence. Like we spend money trying to buy a feeling. Right. And products can't give feelings to us. Like they, they're just inadequate objects, right? It's, it's your mindset and it's your thoughts that you have around it. So it's buy it if you want to. Just don't buy it under the guise of like once I buy it, this is going to be the purchase that's going to make me happy. Mm. Like I always say, we always think we're like one purchase away right. from happiness and from feeling the way that we want to feel like, right. It's like, how many times have you told yourself, like, once I get this, yep. this is going to be it. Too many like, times. <laughs> once I get this, this, this is going to be yeah. it. And then we get it. And then what happens? Yeah. You're like, it's like the novelty wears off. Yep. Two weeks later, we're like on to the next And you're thing. discouraged. You're like, oh, I thought that was going to promise life and joy and it doesn't. And I mean, never will. Yeah. And that's something I preach to my girls a lot is that 
like external additions cannot fix and replace internal insecurities. Yeah. And I'm like, you've got to start with who you are on the inside. Address that. Who am I? Do I like myself? Why don't I like myself? What's going on? Who told me the things I believe about myself? Like you've got to address those and let the things that you put externally be a form of expression for liking ready who you are on the inside. Yes. And I tell that to girls because like you, you can get the newest jeans. You can buy what the TikTok girl says. And then you're still like, why do I hate myself? Why am yeah. I still insecure? Yeah. It's a different conversation, but it does go back to money and shopping and all the things. No, absolutely. It's like you can't ultimately buy things that you can only find in Christ, right? Like that's yep. what I say. Like you cannot fix. I didn't know you were a Christian. Public. Yeah. Yeah. I had a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's like you, 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 it's like you can't buy things ultimately that you can only find in Christ, right? Yeah. It's like only he can give you those certain things that you're ultimately searching for and ultimately you're seeking. And every dollar that you try to spend to do that is just going to be a dollar wasted. For right? sure. So it's like, what I'll give you one more question to ask before you, before you buy things, right? So the one I gave earlier was like, if no one else could see this, if this was only for me, would I still buy it and would I still get it? But another question I always love to ask is, am I trying to buy something that I know ultimately can't be bought? Ooh. Like, am, am I trying to spend my money in a way that I, I know it's not going to buy me the self-worth, That's a quote. the love, the security, right? Because again, it's like those things can only be found in Christ. And it's just like, trying to buy it to your point, it's going to put you on a hamster wheel. You're never going to get gonna off. Win. You're never going to get off. You're, you're playing a losing game. It's a game that can't be won. Mm, I love that quote. That's so good. And I think what I've had to wrestle with in my job and I've dramatically changed is that I didn't start off being a Christian influencer. I was very much like selling products, brand deals, and I still do those, but I've significantly pulled back because there is a guilt on my behalf of knowing I'm contributing to materialism and overconsumption. And so there's a lot of times where I'm like, do, am I posting this just because like, I want to get a quick buck mm -hmm. or because is this, is this beneficial to somebody? And so I've, I've had to even audit myself and be careful what I promote because I still love to talk about products, yeah. but I want to share it because I genuinely love, love, love the product. Not because I'm like, I need to make some quick money this month. So go to my Amazon storefront and buy this random product that actually is crap. Like I never want to do that. And I think that's where sometimes I struggle with bloggers is that they'll promote these products every single day. Yeah. And you're like, no one needs to buy that many things. No one no. can even consume that many things. You can't even use that many things. So I think that's sometimes where I wrestle within at least the blogging world because it, it is promoting a lot of overconsumption. Totally. And you touched on TikTok at the start of this episode. And I, I mean, social media as a whole, but TikTok is like on a whole nother level when it comes to like the overconsumption on TikTok. And I've done a couple of videos that have like gone pretty viral where I just tell people like, the things that you're seeing on social media, like aren't necessarily like, not only are they really not normal for the average person, but they're also not healthy. Like having makeup drawers where you have 15 different foundations and having 25 different tumblers and all of these things. I'm like, I, I, I think it's really important to make your environment purposeful and selective. And like, I'm really big on practicing constraint and like using what, like, especially with like skincare and beauty products and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, use what you have and then use it up. And when you use it up and you want to go buy something else, you can, but I'm like, we, we don't need to live in this world where we have, you know, 15 different choices for the foundation because it's like, we all know we have our one or two. Yeah. That we and those ones are using. just rotting in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> like we all know that we have like our ride or dies, like our one or two that we always go to. Yep. So, but to your point, like TikTok, it's just, it gets eyeballs, it gets views, it gets attention. So people like to show off, but I think, you know, I'll just touch on this too, like with comparison with social media, a common, common question I get is like, how do I stop comparing? How do I stop the comparison that I'm doing from my situation to people I see on social media? And what I always say is, listen, I actually think it's kind of impossible to stop comparing. I think our brains are just designed to compare. Like God made our brains that way to compare for a specific purpose to like yeah. help us stay alive and make sure that we have the resources that we have. But I think in today's world, we compare in a very D like 
a, a, a very like destructive way yeah. versus like a constructive way. Yeah. And it's just taking it back to that. Like, am I being influenced or am I being inspired here? Mm. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, this is just like, I think it's just good for anyone to, you know, not, we're not here to shame or guilt no. anybody, but just to challenge you, convict you and just have an audit, have an audit of your finances, have an audit of your life, your heart posture when you're scrolling. And, um, yeah, and it, it's hard even for me sometimes being an influencer because, yeah. you know, sometimes I'm living in the tension. I'm like, Oh, like I want to share this product, but I'm like, what is my intention behind that? But generally it's hard because I'm like, no, I really want you to love this product. Cause I love it too. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I've even had to ask myself that you challenge myself in that. And it's my, my role, um, on social media is to make sure like I am being authentic and helping people overall. Yeah. And so my goal with this podcast is, yeah, to hopefully help those women or anybody that's listening, um, you know, feel free and be able to scroll and be like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need that. Yeah. And if you do, it's like, buy it, you know, like buy it. But, but what you said, ask yourself those questions before you buy it. Yeah. I, and I think uh, one other like big tip that I'll give you that you can just take from this episode and just start doing today is one of the most helpful things that you can do for spending on social media is giving your brain time to cool off and putting a pause in between seeing something, wanting something, and then wanting to buy it. When that happens, your brain, I always say your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. Okay. Like you go into a very emotional state of mind. You are not in a very like rational logical state of mind. So when you can give your brain at least 24 hours, I think for those of us who struggle with shopping and spending like at least 72 hours, I have something that I call my things I want to buy list. I keep it in notion, but you could keep it in like your notes app on your phone or something like that. But whenever I'm on social media and I see something that I want to buy, or if I'm, you know, at a store, I'll take a screenshot of it or I'll snap a picture of it. And I will add it to my things I want to buy list because a, that gives your brain time to cool off and B remembering what I said about dopamine and dopamine getting released and like the anticipation of getting to buy yeah. something when you're adding it to your list, you're still kind of getting that like feel good right. hit of dopamine. Right. So it still feels just as good as getting to buy it. And I would say like half the things I put on my list when I go back, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not super, right. I'm not super excited about this anymore. That's but then when I do decide to buy something like it's aligned, it's purposeful. I've been thinking about it. I have the money for it. I'm like, yes, this is a good, this is a good purchase. This is aligned. I feel good about this because the times that you spend money and feel bad, like when you have the buyer's remorse, when you have the guilt and the shame, it's often because it was very either impulsive or compulsive. Mm. It's because you didn't give yourself time to kind of like, slow down, think about it. You, I, I, I call it just buying stuff to buy stuff. Yeah. Like don't even matter what so it is. True. Like I'm just buying something cause I want to buy something. Those are often the purchases that make us feel the worst that we get the least use out of and that clutter up our homes and our environments. They just end mm. up stuffed that back is places. So, so true. Yeah. I'm thinking about all the products that I've done that with <laughs> and I'm like, yep, 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 yep. So, so yeah. true. And I'll say it's a practice. Like just just be easy on yourself. Like if you're, if you're in a place right now where you're doing a lot of impulsive shopping, like the best thing that you can do is give yourself grace and be patient and kind to yourself because thinking that you're going to right this ship overnight, like it took, it took me years, right? It took wow. me years yeah. from getting to the point where I was, I mean, I, I was, I was a compulsive shopper. Like there's no doubt about it in my wow. mind. Like I was a compulsive shopper and it took me years to break those patterns. So just be kind to yourself and just know that it's going to take time, but it's just the daily opportunities that you have to practice those things. Like next time you're on social media and you're in that habit of just like, Oh, go into the Amazon store storefront. Oh, go in here, go in here, click and buy, like get, you know, all that yeah. stuff. Just give yourself time to pause. Yeah. Like a little dopamine detox. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just, I, sometimes I tell my brain when my brain gets like real hyper about something that I want, I'm like, we can get it if we want it in a couple of days. Yeah. If I'm still thinking about it in a couple of days, if it still seems very urgent and important to me, I'll revisit it, but we're just going to give ourselves some time to cool off. So it's not really saying no, it's just like not right now. Yeah. Again, the delayed gratification. Totally. I love all these tips. I think this is genuinely going to help some people and it's helping me as well. Um, and can you just list some of those books that you've read that maybe can be good for people for just for finances and stuff? Sure. Yeah. If you can think of any of them. Yeah. So one if there's going to be one book, like if you're, if you're not a big reader or 
reading about money doesn't like super excite you much. The one book that I would highly recommend, it's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I'll send you the link so you can put it in the show notes. But again, I'm a really big fan of that book because again, so much of money is psychology, yep. right? And that book really breaks down money, but also like why you do what you do, right? That's a really good one. If you're looking for a really just good, like practical to like, how do I manage money? The Simple Path to Wealth, uh, J.D. Collins, I believe is the author, but the title is for sure called The Simple Path to Wealth. I will teach you to be rich. Don't get put off by the title of that book. <laughs> like the title of the book is a little like, eh, yeah. but the substance of it is really good. Like it's a very good, just practical, like, okay, here's where to start. That author is Ramit Sethi. He actually just came okay. out with a show on Netflix too. Oh, that's him. Yeah, that's him. I so, love that show. Yeah. That show made me, man, that made me question my entire life. Yeah. So his show is called How to Be Rich on Netflix. Yep. And his book is called I Will Teach You How to Be Rich. So okay. again, I mean, the the title of it's a little like, eh, but the substance is good. For so sure. So between those three books, I think that those- You're set, yeah. Yeah. And I will say too, um, one of my personal favorites that really transformed the way that I view spending money is called The Soul of Money by mm. Lynn Twist. Okay. So good resources. Money. Yeah. So right. I'll send you all those so you can yes, put them please. in the show notes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah. on and just bringing all your wisdom. I sometimes don't know how to address this because I'm like, money yeah. is not my forte. Like that yeah. is something I'm going to pass off to my, my fiance. Um, and I have people that help me because I'm like, I don't like, obviously I don't try to overspend. I like, keep my own budget, but I don't know like what I'm doing half the time. And I think that's a lot of people nowadays. So yeah. thank you for your help, your wisdom, yes. and just let my followers know where they can find you and how they can follow you. Yeah. So on socials, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, I'm at overcoming underscore overspending. That's okay. my handle. Um, I also have a podcast of my own. So if you're just looking for a good money podcast where you can come and learn in a place that's fun, easy to understand, judgment or, you know, like shame-free, judgment-free. My podcast is called The Money Love Podcast. Love it. Yeah. So okay, you I'm going to check that out. Places. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was so great. And I'm sure this will bless my listeners. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.